grateful to my aunt and cousins for opening up their home to me and treating me like a son and a brother, but boy, oh boy, did I need to get out of there. <laughs> you see, I had grown tired of the police pat-downs every time I would enter the building, uh, the dude running past me buck naked in the dead of winter, wearing nothing but Tim's and handcuffs. Uh, the police eventually caught him when he slipped in the snow. Not that they really wanted to grab him, if you know what I mean. <laughs> there was the constant aroma of incense and Mary Jane. And, of course, the arsonist who set the building on fire enough times for the FDNY to become intimately familiar with the locale. Yeah, walk into the Foot Locker on 170 in your socks because you thought it would be another false alarm that would keep you in the lobby for a few minutes. But then you end up walking past a wall of fire and are told you're not getting back into the building or to your belongings for a few days is no fun. I did run into my second cousin, Madi, downstairs, who informed me that the Red Cross was down the block handing out toiletries and setting up people who didn't have a place to stay with the hotel room for the night. She also told me that she made sure to put her name down on the list to get a new apartment in case the building ended up being condemned. I reminded her of the fact that she didn't even live in that building, that her apartment was the next street over, and that eventually someone would verify that fact, but she was determined and unfazed. Whole other story. So, I move into apartment 302, thanks in large part to the fact, to the fact that I'm from the town of Moca in the Dominican Republic, and the super who runs the building also happens to be from that town. Not that that saved me from having to pay a shady broker one month's rent <laughs> on top of the first and last month's security deposit owed to the landlord, Benenson Incorporated. But I had my very own one-bedroom apartment in a relatively quiet area, just a seven-minute walk from my bedroom to my office here at Lehman College, and I loved that place. It was magic. It brought me so much peace and joy and happiness. And in a sense, it became a communal space, because every time I'd go back home to the DR for Christmas or summer vacation, I'd be sure to leave the keys with some friend or another. And my understanding is that some pretty epic parties took place at apartment 302 while I was away. <laughs> it was a place for game nights and movie nights. And the futon in my living room served as a perfect crash pad for a friend in need, or just after late night out when they didn't want to go back home to hear their parents or grandma yell at them for coming home late again. It also served more than one young couple for a few weeks or even a few months while they got on some solid footing and got a place of their own. I even found out that a friend's boyfriend's best friend used to live in that very apartment. Yo, this is where you lived? My boy used to live here with his mom and sisters for years. That's crazy. Small world. So uh, as time went on, years passed, and I got engaged to my college sweetheart and later disengaged, we're still friends. Then I reconnected with my best friend from high school, and we both realized that there was more than just a friendship there. I proposed to her on Valentine's Day 2013, and apartment 302 was decked out that night. I'm talking candles, rose petals, baladas on repeat, and, and the slideshow of our relationship on the TV screen. I uh, hid the uh, engagement ring in an ice cube because I knew she would find it. She loved eating ice cubes. We later found out it was an iron deficiency. Anemia is real, people. Get yourself checked out. But I digress. I loved apartment 302, but I outgrew it. I got married, I had a stepson, and in time, a baby girl on the way. We needed more space. And so the search began for the perfect apartment for our new small family. And our journey took us all the way down the hall to apartment 307, <laughs> two bedrooms. But I was very curious as to who the new steward of apartment 302 would be. And soon enough, I found out. Enter Tyrone, a six foot three, 300 pound black man with a scar on his face and a very unique personality. Tyrone knew more people in the building in two months of being there than I did in the previous eight years living in the spot. This was my first interaction. Yo, you're the one who used to live in my apartment? Uh, 302? Yeah, it's a great apartment. So you're the one who scratched up the floor. What? No, I left that place immaculate. You better take care of it. <laughs> all right, all right. Where you from? Me? I'm Dominican. Dominican? You got that white Hennessy then? What's that? What? White Hennessy? They sell the white Hennessy over there at the Dominican. <laughs> the drink? Yeah, they don't sell it here. That's weird. Why wouldn't they sell it here? They only sell the regular Hennessy here, not the white Hennessy. Can you hook me up with some white penny? Uh, well, I only go to the DR about once a year, but maybe I could get a cousin to bring it over. I'll pay you! All right, well, uh, nice meeting you. Yo, yo, what's your name? Uh, Henry, what about you? Tyrone. Tyrone? Of course. All right, nice meeting you, Tyrone. Take care. 
That was our first interaction. Very soon I learned that Tyrone didn't start conversations in the normal way. There wasn't a good morning, hello, how are you? It was just straight in the middle, straight to the point. I got two refrigerators in my apartment. Oh, hey Tyrone, good evening, how are you? I got two fridges. Okay, why? One for my food, one for my beer. All right, that sounds reasonable. Come see, come see. I really should get in, Tyrone. No, no, come on. Okay. My old apartment was unrecognizable. There was clothes all over the place, a huge empty fish tank, uh, black leather couches facing an exaggerated 70-inch TV in the living room, and the place smelled like a combination of cigarettes, beer, and, well, 15 Marcy Place. That's a huge TV. Oh, wait, you know Angela? Huh? Oh, hi. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, apartment 305 with the dog, right? Let me find out you used to fuck with Henry. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here, here, take this toy for your boy. Oh, all right, uh, thanks, uh, you two. Have a good night. Pretty soon it wasn't just chance encounters in the hallway or by the elevator. My doorbell started ringing, and my doorbell never rang, or if it did, I didn't answer it, because I had had too many bad experiences with royal prestige salesmen, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the people that try to get you to change your electric bill. <laughs> Ding dong. All right. Here. What's this? I baked a cake. Have a slice. <laughs> you bake? Yeah, I was a cook in the army. I'm a disabled veteran. Oh, wow. Yeah, they got the VA hospital over here on Kingsbridge. That's why I got here. Hurricane Sandy's the reason I'm here. Tore up my spot. First they got me a place in Brooklyn, but then I found this place. I thought there'd be parking here, but there's no parking. This shit sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, pretty bad. All right, thanks, Tyrone. Ding dong. Roast the chicken. Oh, okay, thanks. Ding dong. Potato salad. All right, thanks, Tyrone. Just be sure to give me my Tupperware. And remember that white Hennessy. All right, Tyrone, I got you. Thanks. So, annoying as he was, we actually got it on okay. But my wife was not a big fan. You see, Tyrone didn't exactly endear himself to her. He found her by the elevator one time and accused her of stealing one of his containers. <laughs> Yo, I'm missing some Tupperware. You got it? Y'all Spanish people don't give stuff back. <laughs> Mira, no voy a cogerle nada a ese hombre. Then there was the time that he told her to take down the Christmas decorations. Yo, Christmas is over. Take down that wreath. <laughs> this was the day after Christmas, and we usually leave our decorations up till Three Kings Day on January 6th, but Tyrone didn't really look into these matters. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when my baby daughter Abby was born at the end of 2014, and I realized that sleep deprivation is very real, but Tyrone would continue to mercilessly ring that doorbell, waking up the baby. It was time to have a talk with Tyrone. Yo, Henry, where you going? Wait up. Oh, uh, hey, Tyrone, you heading back to the building? Yeah. Did you see that new Spanish chick at the supermarket? Uh, yeah, she knew. Yeah, that bitch is fine. At first I thought she was being rude, but then they told me she don't speak no English. You gotta get them now while they're fresh, before one of you Dominican niggas snatches you up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Listen, I've been meaning to talk to you. No, hold on. Talk to the little old guy for me. What? Yeah, yeah, he sells Dominican by Ed. What? A sweet old guy who mops the floor and takes out the trash? Yeah, yeah, talk to him. I'd rather not. Come on! Okay. Uh, que dice que usted vende Viagra Dominicana? Yeah. Ah, la patilla, pa. Dile que no tengo ahora, pero que son 20 pesos por una docena. Uh, he says he doesn't have any right now, but it's 20 bucks for a dozen. Fuck that! Que dice que no quiere ahora. Told you! <laughs> yeah, listen, Tyrone, I've been meaning to talk to you. Listen, I I'm really appreciative for the toys for my boy and all the food, but... Now that the baby's in the house, when you ring the doorbell, it wakes her up. Oh shit, I done fucked up. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all right, I just can't have you ringing the doorbell. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> I triumphantly go tell my wife that I had my conversation with Tyrone. Our doorbell's not gonna be ringing anymore. <laughs> the very next day, knock, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> told me not to ring the doorbell. That's why I'm not quiet. Come on down, I need a jump. My car, I need a jump. All right, let me grab the keys. Wow, Chevy Astrovan, lots of space. 
Yeah, I'm gonna take it down to Georgia so my nephews can fuck some bitches in the back. Okay. Yeah, I never had any problems with this car, but now I let Angela drive it so she can get to her job faster. But she doesn't put the emergency brake on. I tell her, if you don't put on the emergency brake, that fucks up your transmission. When people are parallel parking, those little bumps will fuck you up. The other day, she even locked the door. Then she'd be calling me, telling me to come down because she can't find no parking. What difference does it make for me to come and circle the block for an hour? I'm too nice. She thinks she's sophisticated because she's a nurse, but she needs a nigga who's going to choke her out. I'm too nice. Uh, yeah, Tyrone, that doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, look that. Take me to the beer warehouse. Listen, Tyrone, I got a lot of stuff to do today. Come on, come on. Come on, it's just around the corner. All right, hop in. All right, just go past the VA hospital. Wait, do you mean the warehouse over by the 207 Street Bridge? Yeah, bring prices there. Tyrone, that is not around the corner. Come on, I'll be quick. Don't drive so fast. I'm doing 30. <laughs> that was Tyrone. So, uh, what you get there? Two cases of the Budweiser? Yeah, that should get me through the weekend. Okay. Ding dong. Who's that? It's Henry from 307. Oh, hold on. Here you go. What's this? I just got back from the DR. Why Hennessy? How much do I owe you? Nah, don't worry about it. It's a gift from one neighbor to another. I need more! I need more! <laughs> Tyrone. A few weeks after that, my doorbell stopped ringing. It turned out that Tyrone actually bought himself a house in the Poconos, Pennsylvania, and moved out. And a few weeks after that, my wife and I bought a house up in Putnam County. So, and our doorbell is definitely not ringing there. And I can only imagine Tyrone walking around his neighborhood in the Poconos going from house to house, but. <laughs> Weirdly enough, uh, even though I don't know who's taking care of apartment 302 now, I am curious about it, Tyrone ended up being one of the best neighbors I've ever had. After Amira, of course. <laughs> and that's my Bronx tale. Thank you. So, as a kid, me and my dad used to take car rides all the time. He would call me up when he got out of work and say, come downstairs. I would hop into the car, get into the passenger seat. My dad would then drive to our local pizzeria, favorite Italian restaurant. He would sing embarrassing ABBA classics, but they're pretty good songs. When we got to the pizza, pizza shop, I would order baked ziti, a big, large dish. My dad used to order pizza with green peppers they used to pick off. Then we'd get back into the car and we would drive for hours, just talking about everything. I would tell him what I wanted to be when I grew up. He would tell me about all the goals he had and how he still hadn't grown up. And we just spent time in the car talking, daughter to father. At 14, my parents got divorced. And while it kind of sucked, the car rides continued. I would hop back into the car, talking with my dad about life. We talked about everything except, of course, the divorce. So at 17, as my dad drove me up for my first semester of freshman year in college. I decided, hey, this is a perfect time to bring up the divorce to dad. Hey dad, you know, we never really talked about the divorce. I wanted to know what happened between you and mom. Cassandra, what do you want to know about the divorce? I'm your father, you can tell me anything. Just so you guys know, my dad has a very thick Arab accent. If you've ever seen Aladdin, you know the first 10 minutes. is a short little merchant guy. He, he's Arab, big nose, short and fat. Well, my dad's not short and fat, but he has the big nose to match. So my dad and me spent the whole car ride driving up for three hours to Albany, talking about the divorce, talking about how he, him and my mom just fell out of love and how things were complicated, but that he loved me. And I knew right there and then I could talk to my dad about anything. He was my best friend at the time. And I knew that for no matter how long I went to college, I'll still have him there. So me and my dad stopped taking the car rides for four years of college. When I moved back home, I was excited to get back in the car. I went downstairs. My dad said, Italian restaurant? I said, yep. He told me, put the address on the phone. I'm going to go get gas. As he went to go get gas, I started writing the address on the phone. All of a sudden, a picture of a woman popped up on the cell phone. She had dark brown hair, beautiful features beautiful Arab teacher, she was slender. I said, wow, dad has a girlfriend. He's finally moved on. Being his only daughter, I was always worried about my father being alone, worried that he wouldn't find someone else. But here he was, having a girlfriend. I said, wow, I can't bring this up to him. How embarrassing would that be, saying, hey dad, how's your love life going? So I decided to just drop it. 
but I was excited inside. A few weeks later, I was on the computer, scrolling through Facebook, saw I had a bunch of mutual friends, and all of a sudden, the picture of this woman pops up, the same woman on his phone. We had mutual friends, so it happened to be all of our mutual friends were family overseas. I said, wow, does dad know that she's on Facebook? So I just started doing some Facebook stalking. <laughs> I looked through her pictures. As I'm scrolling through her pictures, one picture shows up. It's her and my dad, and an older woman in the background. At this time, I started taking beginner Arabic classes. I really was invested in learning a language, especially the one of my father's culture. As I scrolled through the picture, I started looking through the comments. And the caption under the picture read, Baba. Based off my Arabic lessons, Baba meant father. Immediately, I started to think, who was this woman? Was she my dad's girlfriend? Baba? Father? Was he just a father figure to her? I had no idea what to think. I started doing a little bit more Facebook stalking, usually after work. And I spent about three weeks just wondering who this woman was. Thoughts started to run through my head. I hadn't told anyone. Finally, one of my best friends said, let's go grab breakfast. And I thought, all right, I got to share this with someone. I showed her the picture of this woman. I said, hey, this is what I found out. I don't really know what to think. She goes, Cassandra, that girl looks just like you. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's your sister. For a few weeks, things were just running through my head. Finally, I decided to take off a week from work, and I went to Vermont. My mom's best friend lives in Vermont, and it's always the best place to just kind of breathe and relax. There's no New York City pollution, no cars honking, no people yelling out the street. It was just quiet. And so I sat there thinking, the father that I've known my entire life, could he live a double life? I knew that the next move had to be mine. So for a week in Vermont, I ignored my dad's phone calls, something that I had never done. I knew that I had a lot to think about. When I got back to Bronx, my dad decided to pick me up for our weekend drive. I came downstairs. I wasn't as excited to eat baked ziti anymore. My stomach was actually in shambles. I got into the car and I sat in the passenger seat. I couldn't look at my dad, I just looked straight. He then said, why have you been ignoring my phone calls? I said, dad, I don't really know how to say this as my words were stuttering. I couldn't make eye contact. Dad, do you have a daughter? Do you have another family? My dad paused, he didn't really answer at first. And then all of a sudden he laughed. He said, you're so silly. Of course I don't have another family. That's your cousin. That girl that you're talking about, that's your cousin. You don't have to worry about anything. I had this sigh of relief. Wow, how stupid could I be? My dad, the one person I go to with everything, it's just a cousin. Here I was Facebook stalking, might as well have had another degree in that. But I could have just came to my dad and said the truth. So we went to our lunch and enjoyed the time. About a month and a half later, I decided to take my car to the mechanic. Our mechanic happens to be my dad's brother-in-law. Family discount. <laughs> so we get to the mechanic. I sit in the reception area. And the mechanic comes out and says, hey, how's everything going? I said, everything's great. He goes, it's so good that you know about your sister now. Mm -hmm. I was chewing gum and I almost choked. <laughs> I sat there wondering, wait, I thought my dad never said that that was my sister. And thoughts ran through my head. I decided to play along with the mechanic. And I said, yeah, you know, it's so great. So where, where does she live? What does she do? As I asked the questions, I noticed that the mechanic was getting uncomfortable. He knew that I wasn't supposed to know. He started to rush the papers through and said, oh, I got to go check the car now. <laughs> and I knew that I had overstepped with the questions. I got back into the car and I drove home, thinking, wow, has my life been a whole entire lie? My dad, the one person that knew everything about me, that I used to go to, has he been living a double life? For weeks, I spent time thinking, what do I do? What do I say? And I thought also, by me ignoring this, by me not going to speak to my dad about this, I was allowing a man to lie to me, my own father. When I went home, I decided to go back on Facebook and do some extra stalking to make sure I was right about everything. I got on Facebook and I looked at this girl's basic info. Turns out to be she's been here since 2001, graduated from Hunter College, she studied international law. I can memorize and say her entire life based off her Facebook page. As I scrolled through pictures, I saw one picture of her standing and posing. 
in the background is my dad's car. You know, the same car that I sat in the passenger seat. And in the picture, she's wearing a gray, sparkly top. I took a break from the Facebook page and ran to my closet to find the same gray, sparkly gray top in my closet. It was a gift for Christmas. And I thought, this is everything I needed to know. So going forward, there's a lot that I have to talk to with my dad. But this time, when I come downstairs, I'm not sitting in the passenger seat. I'll be sitting in the driver's. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, my name's not Linda. <laughs> um, but I learned about that later. We'll talk more about that. There was a hearing impaired girl. There was an interracial couple who I did not know was interracial until I was 20. I just thought Miss Aggie was a big, light-skinned black lady. I didn't know. And we didn't know. We didn't have that kind of information, nor did we care. That was our family. Those were our neighbors. Those were the people who took care of us. Yet, there was love for everybody, but yet, hmm, behind the doors, behind that door of 11B, the love that I felt in my neighborhood, the love that I felt from my neighbors, from Miss Mary, who taught me how to make sauce, that you call sauce. She taught me how to make gravy, because that's what real Italians do. When I went behind those doors, that love wasn't there. Oh, I had food, I had clothing, I had shelter, but there was no such thing as the love word in my house. Now, remember, I got dropped off. I was dropped off by my mother to my grandmother. So there was really a moment where I guess my grandmother was really pissed off, and she took it out on me. So there were days where I had to say things like, I'm not nothing, because my mother ain't nothing. And she'd say, say it louder. I ain't nothing, because my mom ain't nothing. She'd say, say it louder. And usually, there was a crowd of people, because she had these big parties. I ain't nothing, because my mother ain't nothing. She said, now go to your room. So now the tears are falling. And then she'd come in with the infamous, if you don't shut up, I'm going to give you something to cry for. Didn't she just do that? <laughs> Behind the door. And then there were the inappropriate touches and kisses from the man I called my grandfather. Midnight, all the time. But then I could step outside. So don't feel sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for me. Let, me. let me make it very clear. My neighborhood was what saved me. That's why I stand here before you. I had teachers who told me I could. I had neighbors who thought I was very pretty. Because I took seventh grade Spanish and figured out this little thing was not saying Linda for no reason. <laughs> um, and, you know, I would look for him. So those days when it was ugly, those are the people you look for. You look for those neighbors to come out and make you feel good about you. Those neighbors who rubbed your back, told you you looked great, said hello, told you you had a great smile. The neighbors made a difference. We had a sense of community. We had a sense of love. We had a sense of caring. And we had a sense of kindness. And we had a sense of security, even if it wasn't behind the doors. So you guys help me out with this. Who took neighbor out of the hood? Because we sure need it. Winter. I think I was feeling a little happier than usual because I was wearing a coat I actually picked out. I mean, that was the first. The day I got my coat, um, my grandfather and I, we walked along the Grand Concourse and I thought it was just to take a walk. And suddenly we get to Fordham and one more block and it's Robert Hall. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's a man's store. And I figured we're going in to get something for him. And he took me to the children's coats and told me to pick one out. And I, I couldn't even believe it. I said, really, me? I could pick it out? It'll be mine? Because everything I wore had my cousin's name tag, in it, mm. including socks, underwear, hair. <laughs> so anyway, um, so this was amazing. So I went right to the red corduroy with a fuzzy collar, a white collar, 
And I was just delighted. I mean, I was just more delighted than I remember most days ever being. And so I wore it home. And when we got home, my grandmother was furious. And she said, you let her pick that out? She looks like a house. That alpaca is going to get black. And I was, I was just feeling terrible that my grandfather seemed I saw him as getting in trouble for doing something nice for me. I don't think I think he was better at letting it roll off than I was. So anyway, I still loved my coat. And um, so I was wearing this coat on this winter day, fifth grade, and I was going home for lunch. He actually lived near the school, so you know. And it was about five after twelve in the day. And I entered my lobby, and I was either nine going to be ten, or I had just turned ten. So I'm, I'm all in there with my red corduroy coat and my hat with a brim and a pom-pom. And, and the, um, I knew everybody in the building, every single apartment. So I was very proud of that. So when I went in, um, there was a girl, Janet, a teenager in my building. She went to the nearby Catholic school. She had the hair that was the hair to have at the time. She had long, straight, blonde hair. And I just, I guess I just didn't like her. <laughs> I mean, so many girls scotch taped their hair and, and dippity dooed it and even ironed it to try to have that kind of hair. And she just had that hair. Anyway, so she's waiting for the elevator, and in comes this man who didn't live in the building. Because remember, I did know everybody. And um, he's looking around. So I'm thinking, oh, he does not show where he's going. And I figured he's going to ask me, like, where does so-and-so live, or where's apartment, whatever. So we all wait for the elevator, and then we go in, and she presses three. And he waits, and I press five. And then he chooses to press four. That stayed with me forever. Anyway, so um, the whole time in the elevator, he's staring at her. And I'm thinking, well, because she's pretty. She's got the long blonde hair, you know, and I'm just a kid. And he was a reasonable looking guy, whatever I thought at 10 years old. I don't know. Anyway, um, she gets out at three. And then it gets to the fourth floor. And he goes to the door. And I'm still expecting him to ask me where somebody lives. And he opened, and the automatic door opens, and then he pushes the other door with his back. He looks in the hall, looks back at me, and says something. And at first, I didn't hear him right. So still all innocent and eager to show off all my information, I went, what? And he went, how's that? And I saw motion, and, and I looked down. And he had his penis in his hand. And I had never, ever seen an adult man's penis. And it was nothing like a baby cousin getting diapered. <laughs> I mean. And he said, how's that? And I, besides scared, I had no way to make sense out of this. Why a grown man would do anything like that to a kid. What that meant, what he wanted what it was even called. I didn't know any of this, because in my house, a male, a, a penis was a wee-wee. That's where my head was. OK. And this was not wee. <laughs> and uh, he pulled on it, and it kept growing, it seemed to me. And of course, I'm thinking of things like, like clay. It just keeps stretching. <laughs> and, and it had all this hair. And I, I, I was sweating way more than now. You know, I was really sweating, and I was trembling, and I was crying, because all that came to my mind was words that you see on the front page of the newspaper, like missing, kidnapped, murdered. And I had no other explanation for what was going on. And so I'm holding the back of the elevator wall, and I'm wishing that it would open and just let me fall out. So... At the next, some point, he looks at me, and this was even more confusing. He looks at me and, like he felt sorry for me, and he said, don't cry. 
So that felt even more crazy to me. So I, and again, I had no understanding of what could this be about. So I thought, I'm never going to see my family again. I'm getting kidnapped. And I was shaking and crying and sweating. And maybe that's not what he was looking for. I have no idea. And then he looks out again at the fourth floor and he leaves. So I'm crying and shaking and going to the fifth floor and crying and banging on the door. My grandmother opens the door. What happened? And I can't even remember the words I used to tell her what happened. But I told her, and she, her reaction was, go make sissy right now. I went, but I don't have to. That was PP in our house. Okay. And she went, you do go make sissy right now. And then we had my teenage aunt, who was a um, difficult person. And she was there. Ooh, some man showed his thing to Mindy. Ooh, and she was just delighted to have now something, some entertainment. <laughs> and I guess um, that although, you know, it was humiliating, but I didn't, I wasn't disappointed because I didn't expect anything different from her. I mean, she was the same aunt who, when I was very proudly learning how to read in first grade, my Dick, Jane, and Sally book. She took it and went, ooh, Mindy's reading about Dick and balls, ooh. So, okay, so that was my aunt. And then my mother was around, okay? My mother wasn't always the healthiest person emotionally, but she was the most loving person in my family. So I was glad she was there, but a little disappointed that it seemed like she wanted to laugh. <laughs> because of her younger sister, you know, carrying on. And, but she controlled herself. And of course, my grandmother had ordered me to the bathroom, so I went there. My mother came with me, and I was telling her what happened. And she just didn't act like anything had happened. And so I said, why aren't we calling the police? And she said, oh, no, he's gone already. I said, well, that's why we have to call the police. That's what they do. She said, oh, no, he's in another building already doing that to another little girl, as if that would make me feel better. And I was like, that's why we have to call the FBI. And she said, that's just on TV. And I was scared to go back to school. I was scared to go in the elevator, all of that. She said she would take me to school that day. So she did after lunch. I, she took me back to school. I don't have hardly any memory, and I remember loads of stuff, but of that afternoon at school, so I probably didn't tell anybody anything. I was really shocked. I was just in shock. And then that evening, my grandfather was home from work, and he's in the kitchen having dinner. And my grandmother said, and I was right outside the kitchen. There was a desk where I was doing homework. And my grandmother said to him, A man exposed himself to Mindy in the elevator today. And I was so embarrassed. I just, even though I hadn't done anything, I didn't expose him. I was just so embarrassed. I couldn't even look in his direction. And I mean, he was a man, and I, it was just all so embarrassing. And so I could feel in the silence, though, that he knew how I felt. And, and, and I can also feel him almost burning inside because it was his nature, no matter what his physical condition was, he would have wanted to knock the guy out. I mean, that would have been his desire. Whatever he was capable of, I don't know, but he felt like a young, strong man, no matter. So he definitely would have wanted to protect Anyway, even to this day, I have the ambivalence toward the penis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
even if it's like something that costs a dollar, like look at my earrings, isn't it fabulous? And there were special occasions on when you went full on display. One set occasion is when we would go on vacation to Dominican Republic. We would go ornamented like a Christmas tree. <laughs> Why? I'll tell you why. Because to the people in the island, when you live in the States, no, I'm sorry, not in the States, when you live in New York, mm -hmm. it means you're rich. Little do they know, but okay, you're rich <laughs> automatically. Ay, ella de York, tiene cuarto. That means you have money. So the people at TSA probably hated us because we would spend hours in the line to wait <laughs> to get into the metal detectors just taking off the mounts of jewelry. <laughs> Because it was all fake, like you would pass through and go ring, ring, ring. But we would get there to DR looking like Mr. T clones. <laughs> <laughs> and again, two quarters of it, not even, two thirds of it was totally fake. But the people in the campo didn't know that. To them it was like, oh my God, look at the jewelry that they have on, it's beautiful. Now when we would go to DR, we'd spend it at my grandma's house. And I didn't have a good relationship with my grandma. It's not that we hated each other, we just barely talked and we just didn't have great communication. Um, she was very stoic, not affectionate at all. She had what is known as resting bitch face. Um, <laughs> but it's okay because she held down the fort. You needed something, she got it. The food was always there at breakfast at nine in the morning. Lunch was always ready by 12 noon and dinner was always served at seven like clockwork. She had everything held down and so well respected in the neighborhood. Everyone feared her for life. I remember one time there was these kids, um, they threw a ball into the front patio and they were like so scared to get it because it's like, oh my God, it's in la casa de Doña Gina, can't go in there. <laughs> she was very well respected and feared and she was just dead. And so I, would, I tried to build a relationship with her, I really did. But she was just not there. They'd be like, Grandma, I love you. Hug, kisses. I keep up. Okay, thanks. But again, accessories. So we would bond over that. She had this pair of beautiful gold emerald earrings. And I would always bother her about them. We're like, Abuela, es I love those earrings. Can I have them? She'd be like, Cuando yo me muera. When I die, you can have them. <laughs> See, the earrings were very special to her because there was a story behind the earrings. She got them when she was 14. They were pure, pure gold, and they cost her 200 pesos, which today is the equivalent of like five US dollars. But back then, it was a big deal, like it was a lot of money. And the very same day that she got them, dictator Trujillo was in town. So for those of you that don't know, he was a very ruthless dictator, and whatever he want, he got. Speaking in terms of women, if he had you on his radar, you had to sleep with him. And my grandmother, she wasn't the youngest, but she was one of the youngest out of nine girls. And in our neighborhood, the Herman women, the nine Herman women, were very famous because they were very beautiful and it was nine of them. So Trujillo was in town, so he pulled up at the Herman household to meet the nine Herman women. And eight of the nine women weren't there, but my grandma was there. And she just come home with her beautiful brand new earrings. She was so ecstatic and she was showing them off. And his car pulled up in the front. And so my great grandmother, Mama Hinelina, um, hid her under the bed. Hide and stay there because we don't want you going away with dictator Trujillo. And so the earrings were a constant reminder of the love that her mother had for her. Because had El Jefe found out that you lied to him, that you told him that she wasn't there when she was, that you took away his potential new boo, his new wife, he would have had you killed. So it took guts for my great grandma to do that. And it just reminded her of that day and how special she felt and so protected and the unconditional love. And I would hear that story every single time I would comment on the earrings, like literally. Like she could have finished telling me yesterday and I'd be like, Grandma, those earrings. Déjame decirte de parir. Me costaron 200 pesos. Y el día que yo lo compré, vino Trujillo para casa y me escondieron a la cama. Yes. The bed. We were under the bed for three hours. And they were just so cute. And I just, I, I, I don't know. They really, I was really attracted to those earrings. I loved them. They were 
shiny and I just one day she was taking a shower and she took them off and I want to see how they look like so I put them on and I turn around and she's behind me <laughs> I just, I just want to see what they look like okay sorry grandma and I mean we didn't talk but when we did talk it was always about the damn earrings because that's the only common ground we had <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> um so we one day are here chilling in my apartment in the Bronx and we get the call. It was really early, like nine in the morning, and grandma suffered a stroke. And as horrible as it sounds, I didn't feel anything. Like it was like, oh grandma had a stroke. That sucks. So my mother goes to DR to, you know, take care of her ill mother, and then I get the call a week later from my mother that grandma passed away. And again, as, as as horrible as it sounds, again, I tell nothing. It was like, oh no, grandma passed away. That sucks. But I was more concerned about my mom, like how my mom's going to take it. I was more worried about her. So I stayed here and held on the fort while my mother went and dealt with the funeral stuff over there. And then my mother comes back. And of course, she's, she's grieving. She's very upset. And so I try to make her feel better the best way I know how. Let's show off some accessories. <laughs> hey, Ma, I got this at a sale at Claire's. And uh, she's like, oh, that's nice. Speaking of jewelry, I have something for you. And I'm like, OK, what is it? She pulls out of her bag like a twisted up napkin. And I'm like, it looks like a tooth. Like, the way you wrap up a tooth, I'm like, give me a tooth. What is this? So she pulls it out and I open it and she's like, before you open it, she told me right before she died to give them to you because she wants you to remember that even though she didn't always show it, she loved you so much and she's so proud of you. And she knows that you would take very, very good care of them. And I open it up and it's the ears, these ears. Aww. Grandma's ears. <laughs> And at that moment, it was like, like a cascade. Mm -hmm. Because I realized I'm never gonna see her again. I'm never gonna hear that annoying story <laughs> of how she hid under the bed for three hours. I'm never gonna have another one of her breakfasts that were right on time at nine, her, her lunch at noon, her dinner at seven. And it just reminded me, I'm at the point of my life where there's a lot of drama going on, dealing with uh, fake people, if you will, people that will say that I'll be with you, but when push comes to shove, they disappear. Or people that uh, fill your mind with pretty little lies, and then just when they get what they want, they leave. They're the fake jewelry, if you will, the 99 cent store jewelry that you get, that when you put in the liquid, just sinks but not grandma grandma didn't show it but grandma was always there and just like the earrings her love was pure pure gold and that's family family will always be there and that's the lesson i learned this day and i will continue to carry with me that there's people that will tell you what you want to hear the fake 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 jewelry and then there's a real deal 24 karat gold like that thank you Bronx, that's where my story begins. My story is a story of ingredients that have shaped me and made me who I am today. Even before I was born, life already had a death sentence against me. See, I was born premature, two pounds and 11 ounces. Stories are told that I could be held in just the palm of a hand, a small hand, because everyone in my family is short people. <laughs> Even before I was born, life had a death sentence against me. Let me explain that. See, my father was about that savage life. My father was about that hood life without the neighbor. My father had a girl on the side. My father got AIDS. My mother, yeah, she was a little crazy herself. My mother had HIV. So when I was born premature, two pounds and 11 ounces, even before the moment that I 
breathed my first breath of air. Life had already a death sentence against me because I was born with HIV. And I was so sick at the moment that my mother didn't have the chance to embrace me, so I never got to feel that hug that that mother, that every mother shares with her child. I was immediately incubated, and I believe I was there for about four months, isolated by myself. And during that time, where my world was just this box, the woman who gave birth to me just a month after she did passed away. There's even a family rumor that has never been confirmed that my sister's dad went to the hospital and overdosed her somehow. But my grandparents were there, my maternal grandparents, they came in, they uh, spoke to the doctors and even though the doctors told them, listen, he's not gonna survive, he's not gonna make it to one, we, he, he's too sick and there are things with his brain and there's fluid and there's liquid and they, he's just too sick. But my grandparents, they took a stand, they said, no, we're not gonna accept this and they took me to a different hospital. There they began to give me certain medications and I began to get a little bit better so I made it to one. And then at two, I had chronic asthma, pneumonia, and wasn't breathing correctly, was having uh, multiple asthma attacks, and they told my grandparents, listen, we're not sure he's going to make it to three. But I made it to five. <laughs> Kindergarten. I had my first crush. <laughs> Her name was Celeste. I was in love. <laughs> <laughs> then I made it to sixth grade. You see, and I'm sorry, I was six years old when I made it to first grade and it was at that time where my father came out of nowhere because he wasn't really around but he came and he brought me a baseball glove, he brought me a bike and three books. One of them was 101 Dalmatians. But unfortunately we never got to read the books, we never got to play catch, we never got to ride the bike. Because at six years old my father was murdered. See. He went to prison, but before going to prison, he told my grandmother, he said, listen, when I come out, I'm going to be there for my son. And he was. He got me the books and the gifts. Yeah, he was. But it was short-lived because he went to prison because he had a fight with some people. He paralyzed one guy and things got ugly and those same guys came back and they found their revenge and fought with my dad and threw him in the street and the car ran him over. But at six years old, I didn't know this story. This story wasn't told to me at the time. It was just, I have these books and this glove and this bike. What do I do with them now? I made it to fifth grade. And in fifth grade, I had this amazing teacher. I was being bullied a little bit here and there. Didn't know how to play sports because my grandfather, who was my father figure at the time, was wheelchair bound. Being in fifth grade in recess as a young boy, if you don't play sports, you get bullied. But this teacher, Mr. Tony Blatter, would actually take time to teach me how to play sports, football, catch. He would tell me to speak up for myself, to defend myself. See, because I was that kid that I was too scared to raise my hand, but I would tell my neighbor, oh, the answer's five. And my neighbor, little Billy, would raise his hand and say, the answer's five. And Sometimes the teacher will respond, Jonathan, you have to be more like Billy. <laughs> so this fifth grade teacher invested in me. He taught the whole child in me more than just reading, math, and science. So that was a great start to fifth grade. But towards the end of fifth grade, as I was walking home, and there's that uncle who doesn't usually stop by, and you're just wondering, why is he waiting for you in front of the building? And he takes you upstairs, and he takes you to the back room, and he asks you, hey, do you want to see Papa? your grandfather in the hospital. And I actually said, no, not today. Then he continued to tell me and said, well, you're never going to get to see him because Baba passed away. Then it made sense why he was waiting for me downstairs because he didn't want me to see the sign that was placed in the lobby that the neighbors would know. At 10 years old, I became the man of my house. but I made it sixth grade. And I wanted to redefine myself. I wanted to be cool, I wanted to be popular, I wanted to be a man. So, I became a rapper. And 
I could never freestyle though. So what I would do, I would go home and I would write my rhymes and go to school and be like, guys, I'm gonna make this up right now, right now. Ready, ready? <laughs> Straight fire. <laughs> and yeah, I wrote that last night, but I would never tell them. <laughs> I remember seeing a new crush, seventh grade crush, Alicia. I remember seeing her, she was standing right next to my best friend, Michael. And I walked up to Michael and I said, what's up? And I punched him in the face. That, that was how I said, what's up? Um, because I wanted to impress Alicia. Uh, she wasn't really that impressed. Nothing really happened between us. And, uh, the other unfortunate part was that uh, Michael actually punched me back. <laughs> so I got suspended. And throughout middle school, I got into a few more fights, and suspended another time, and cut class here and there, and didn't get the best grades, and felt less than average, and had about a C average, 70 to 75. But there was this moment in eighth grade where, despite being the shyest kid, my, my eighth grade crush, yeah, I know. I'm not a player, I just crush a lot. <laughs> so she was actually the smartest girl in the class, probably in the school, and she was absent this day. So the teacher, math teacher, had a very thick Spanish Dominican accent. He said, okay, no lesson today. And my fellow students, classmates didn't understand or just wasn't understanding the new math lesson. So the teacher asked me, John, could you help me with the students? And I said, okay, because I was always complete, competing with Altagasia, my crush. And so I helped my friends at the time, and I was extremely shy. So it was difficult for me, but I stepped up to the plate. And when the first student, classmate, friend told me, wow, John, I actually get this, it touched my heart. And it was one of the most fulfilling moments in my life at the time that my life with the ingredients I had happened to me at the time or in my life, I can actually make a difference. So I went into ninth grade knowing that I wanted to make a difference, knowing that I wanted to help others, inspire others. I had goals to be a teacher. But it, something occurred after eighth grade, right before ninth grade, I started going to a church and in that church I found mentors. I found the pastor who had a degree in law and his, his wife, the pastora, who had her degree in counseling and the different leaders and the different men and women there who believed in me and inspired me and said I can be someone. So I went into ninth grade with this new mindset that, hey, I can make a difference. People believe in me. My first marking period average was a 92 from a 70 to a 92. So all throughout high school, I made it very clear that I had goals to be an educator, goals to make a difference. And that kid that was in fights, that kid that punched his best friend, that kid that lost his mom, that kid that lost his dad, that kid that lost his grandfather, that kid that was bullied, that kid graduated high school with honors in math and science and a full scholarship to teach at Lehman College. Right. So the summer came straight out of high school. I'm at Lehman, falling asleep in class, taking <laughs> free calculus. From that moment, I felt that graduating would take forever. But I made it to 2010. And 2010 was uh, my sophomore year in college. I'm sorry, 2009. Sophomore year in college, and. I wanted to make a difference, and I wanted to make a difference now, and at 19, still a teenager, I decided I'm going to start my own business. I had no idea what I was doing, but at 19, I started my own business, and the name said it all. The name represented my heart. The name represented who I was, By Your Side Tutoring. It's the name of my company, a tutoring company that helped students in the community who didn't have the support and help that they needed to succeed. And then 2010 came in, 2011, 12, 13, and then 14. Six years after going to college, I finally graduated. And as I walked down, I got to hold the department banner. The ceremony was beautiful. But the best part was looking through the massive audience, trying to find that little lady in her polka dot dress, that little lady that would run with me to the hospital, that would 
run with me to church to pray for me. That little lady that was there when I graduated kindergarten, that little lady that was there when I graduated from elementary school, that little lady that was there when I graduated from middle school, that little lady that was there when I graduated from senior year of high school, that little lady that was now there in her polka dotted dress. My mom, my grandmother who raised me. And I gave her a hug and full cap and ground, even though it felt like it would never happen. I told her I made it. I'm a college graduate. 31 years after my grandfather graduated from Lehman College. So my story is a story of tragedy to hope. I spoke about ingredients. My story is a story of lemons to lemonade. This is my Bronx story. Thank you. What I want to do is get everybody up here for a big round of applause for the whole group. Come on. So, folks, we're going to try to do this on a semi-regular basis. So, if you have if you have stories that you want to tell, or you have you know somebody that has a story they want to tell, or you just want to come check us out, um, info at Lehman Stages. You can get in touch with us that way.